If you got your Bibles, lift them up this morning and repeat after me. Say, this is my Bible. Every word in it is true. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught God's word. It's his truth transforming every part of my life. And I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's cool to look around and see some of the kids raising their Bibles up this morning. That's awesome. So week six in our series on Empowered about the Holy Spirit. Next week, I'm going to wrap the series up. But I've really enjoyed this series. It's helped me. I hope it's helped you. Today, we're going to talk about what it actually means to be empowered practically, what that looks like. Because we talk about being empowered by the Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. But what happens? I mean, what, what's the purpose? What's the point? And what can we do with that baptism? Acts 1 verse 8 says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. So we see here that Jesus says we're going to receive the power that he promised us. The purpose of the power is so that we can be witnesses. Witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That means I'm going to give you power to be a witness for me wherever you go. Wherever in the world you are, I'm giving you power to be a witness. In other words, I'm giving you power to represent me. That's what the power is for. So what does that look like? Well, look at 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 11 in your Bibles this morning or on the notes on the screen. And we're going to talk about what these gifts of the Spirit are that empower us. There's, there's nine listed here. There, that's not a conclusion. There's more things that you can get, but these are the nine primary that you're going to see here. And we're going to go through those. I'm going to explain those briefly this morning. First Corinthians 12, one through 11. Now about the gifts of the spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. The other word there is another version that says, I do not want you to be ignorant. We covered ignorant last week. Ignorant in the South usually means stupid. That's not what this means. Ignorant means uninformed. You don't know. So if you're ignorant of something, it doesn't mean you're dumb. It means that you just don't know. So he says, look, I just want to, I want to wipe away the, the dust. I want to just push the smoke back. I want you to be, you understand what these gifts are so that you're informed so that now you know. Okay. So here's what he said. You know that when you were pagans, how many of you have ever been a pagan? Nobody, no pagans. If you were a pagan, raise your hand. Okay, so some of you have been pagans. Thanks for your honesty. All right, he says, you know that you were pagans. Somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray by mute idols, things that weren't God. Therefore, I want you to know that no one is speak who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. And then he goes into the gifts. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. Now the spirit there is a capital S talking about the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. And there are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. So he's saying here, listen, there's different gifts that are available, but there's only one Lord. And all these gifts work together for a common purpose. Verse seven, now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. Everybody say common good. Now I'm going to cover this in a minute, but I want you to understand this today. The gifts of the Holy Spirit that are given to us are given for other people. God blesses you to bless others. What does that mean? Well, Miss Connie was here first service. How many of you have ever had one of Miss Connie, Connie's cinnamon rolls? Can I see your hands? Can I get a witness? Yes. Miss Connie's cinnamon rolls are amazing. They will change your life, okay? But here's the thing. Miss Connie is gifted at giving those cinnamon rolls. Those cinnamon rolls are amazing. But here's the deal. If she only made those cinnamon rolls and kept them at home, I would feel two ways about her. First, I would feel she was being selfish. Because she made all those cinnamon rolls and she's not going to eat them. But she, so, so the first thing is she was giving, but the second thing is the whole reason she made them was that, so she could give them away to bless other people. It's the same way with the gifts of the spirit. God may give you a gift. The Holy Spirit may come on you and you may have a manifestation on one of these gifts, but the manifestation of that gift is to help someone else. Does that make sense? That's what Paul is saying here. Okay. 
So, to one there is given the spirit of a message, of, excuse me, a spirit of a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healings by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these gifts work of one and the same spirit, and notice this, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Another version says the Holy Spirit gives these gifts to whoever he determines, however he sees fit. So the Holy Spirit distributes the gifts to people that he determines, and I would say also many times as they need them for a purpose. Now, I want to dispel something today. Look at number one on your notes. You ready? The Holy Spirit is charismatic. The Holy Spirit is charismatic. The word charismatic comes from the Greek, from the Greek word charisma, which means grace gift. Grace gift. What does that mean? Big thought today. If you have a gift, uh, excuse me, a gift God gave you by grace, you are charismatic. Now, in our culture, in our background, especially denominational backgrounds, people are called charismatic. They go to a charismatic church. But here's what this means. You can be Baptist, go to a Baptist church, be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and you are now considered a charismatic Baptist person. Why? Because the gifts of God's grace can flow through you. It's not a denominational thing. It is a positional thing. I'm going to say that again. It is not a denominational thing. It is a, peti- a, a positional thing. In other words, this is a Christian thing. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for every Christ follower who will receive him. It does not matter where you go to church. Do you understand me? So it's not about, well, that's a charismatic church. Well, you may go to a charismatic church, and, and, but if these people aren't filled with the Spirit, that's just the name on the building. It's about the position of the person, not the name on the building. Does that make sense to you? So it's very, very important. So 1 Corinthians 12, 1 says this. He wants us to not be ignorant of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has all nine of these gifts. And he manifests them through believers as he will. Now listen to these words. This is very important. Any believer can move in any of the gifts when they are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do so. Any believer, any Christ follower, any person that's received the baptism of the Holy Spirit can move in any of the nine gifts. They are not exclusive to only certain people. So any person can operate in these gifts. Big thought, I said this earlier. The gifts are used to bless other people. That's what the purpose of the gifts are for. Now, the the gifts are broken up into three different areas. I'm going to cover these briefly, and then I'm going to explain this concept to you guys. The first group of gifts, there's three of them, are the discerning gifts. That's what theologians call them. And these gifts show insight and understanding. I call them, these are the gifts of knowing. K-N-O-W-I-N-G. So what's the first one? The first one is a word of knowledge. What is a word of knowledge? It is to know something specific without knowing it by natural means. That means you know something that you shouldn't know because God showed it to you. Now, think about this. How could this come into practice naturally? How many of you have ever run into a situation that you didn't know how to solve? There was something you you needed to know, but you didn't in yourself know how to accomplish this thing or deal with this issue or deal with this problem. God can give you, if you ask him, spirit-filled believer, God, show me, give me a word of knowledge, and that means you can know something specific by knowing it with natural means. Here's another way it could work out. If I'm praying for someone, sometimes I can get a word of knowledge about a situation that that person is dealing with, and I would know something about this situation that I shouldn't know in natural means. This is a supernatural deal. And in a few moments, I'm going to show you why this is all important for you as a Christ follower. Now, the second one is a word of wisdom. A word of wisdom is a divine answer or solution for a particular event. This means there's something going on and you need wisdom about what to do in this situation. How many of you have faced a challenge and you weren't sure what to do? A job. There was situation, there was something that happened and you have to make a decision about this situation. 
And it's important. This is where supernaturally God can give you insight because this is why this is important. How many of you would agree that God knows things that you don't know? Okay, that's important. Because sometimes when we pray and we ask God to help us in a specific situation to know something about a specific situation, yes, no, whatever it is. Lord, I'm dealing with this thing. Do I take this job? That's an easy example. Okay, here's the deal. God sees the whole thing. You only see what's right here. And so God may say, yes, do this. Or he may, may say, no, don't do it, because he sees the whole picture. And there are times in your life, there will be multiple times in your life, when you will be dealing with the situation, and you need the wisdom of God to deal with the situation that you're in. And that is a supernatural gift that God can give you in those situations. Do you realize you don't have to know everything to have access to the one who does? That's an amazing thing. The God of the universe can drop something in your spirit and you know what you need to do in a situation with a word of wisdom. Here's the final one in verse three. Discerning of spirits to be made aware of the presence of a demonic spirit. Now, why is this important? Here's the deal. I do not believe there are demons under every rock. Okay? I don't, I don't believe that. But here's what I do believe because I've encountered it before. I do believe there are demons and I do believe that demons show up. And sometimes he shows, they show up in the lives of people. And so there are maybe situations that we deal with where we have to recognize that we are dealing with something other than just an individual. That there's something else at work here. There's something else going on. Have I dealt with people that have a demonic spirit in them? Yes, I have. Have I dealt with situations where there was something behind the scenes making things? Yes, I have. Let me give you an example of a feeling sometime. How many of you have ever been to New Orleans? Have you felt something there that felt dark? Right. There are, there are places that you can go sometimes where you can feel the presence. of. As a Christ follower, sometimes you can walk into a place and you feel like, man, something is wrong. Right? And you recognize sometimes that can be a demonic situation. The reason this is important is that sometimes when we're dealing, especially with people, if you realize there's something going on in that person's life where there's a demonic stronghold in their life, they may even be possessed by a demon. I have to deal with that situation separately than I would if I'm just dealing with somebody that's dealing with the challenge and that's not involved. So the demonic is real. But... When we're dealing with a situation where there is a demonic presence there, we need to understand from God what's going on so that we know how to deal with the situation. And that is one of the gifts of the Spirit that he can empower us with. The next three gifts are the declaration gifts. They're they're declarative gifts, which means it's the saying or speaking gifts. The first one is the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is where a message of encouragement comes from God to a person. It always brings edification, exhortation, and comfort to other people. It can also bring sometimes when that exhortation can mean, hey, God's speaking to you and he's giving you a warning about something. Now, how does this work practically? Over the years, I've received many uh, prophetic words that people have given me. Uh, Just two weeks ago, I had a friend in Canada, and he called me, left me a voicemail. It was during church. He left me a voicemail and said, hey, I was out walking today, and I was praying for you, and I really felt like the Lord spoke to me and gave me this prophecy over your life, and he left it on my voicemail. I listened to it multiple times. It was great. God can do that. God can give you a word through other people. Now, you have to watch this, okay? You have to test those things. And usually there'll be a peace that comes when someone gives you one of those words. I remember when I was in college, I had a a lady come up to me, girl came up to me and said, listen, I was praying and God told me that you were going to be my future husband. She was being prophetic. She was wrong. (laughs) Okay. So, so we have to, t- <laughs> Russ is laughing. We have to test that. Not everybody that comes up and says, I have a word of God from you, has a word of God for you. Sometimes they had bad pizza or they had bad motive, different motives than yours. But that's why you need the Holy Spirit inside of you to discern whether this is for you or not. The power and the presence of God. So, but we believe as a church, God can bring prophetic words through people. And there are times 
that, that God will speak to me about something going on in someone's self life. Prophetically, he says, listen, you need to go pray for them and tell them this. That's a big deal. And we need that guidance and direction. What's interesting is usually when the gift of prophecy comes, it comes because you're dealing with something where you need God to speak. Sometimes he'll speak directly to you. Sometimes he'll speak directly through someone else to you. Okay? So just remember that. Here's the second thing. The, the declarative gifts of tongues. A tongues is a message from God in a language unknown to the person through whom the message comes. See, tongues is speaking in an unknown language. Okay? If I speak in Spanish, but I know Spanish, that is a, not an unknown language to me. I actually am fluent in two languages, English and Texan. I understand them both. Uh, depending on where you are in the South, you understand what I'm talking about, okay? Um, but I don't understand Spanish. I know a few words, but I don't speak Spanish fluently. You start, unless you say taco, burrito, or something like that, I don't have any idea what you're saying, right? But, but one of the things, no, actually, I do know a phrase in Spanish. I learned this when I was in junior in high school. Donde esta embasario de Estados Unidos? Where is the American embassy? <laughs> Marty, I learned that. I taught myself that. I remember being in high, uh, that's funny, the things you remember. I remember being in high school, uh, Spanish class, and being taught by Mr. Solis, and, and Mr. Solis taught us, and I learned, where's the American embassy? Because I thought, if I'm anywhere in a Spanish-speaking country, that's all the Spanish I need to know. <laughs> Maybe I should loan Don't Day McDonald's, because, you know, then that I, Show me where McDonald's is. So tongues is a message from God in a language unknown to the person through whom the message comes. The interpretation of tongues, understanding and expressing the thought or intent of the message in tongues. It is an interpretation, not a translation. That's important. If someone speaks in an unknown tongue and someone interprets that message in tongue, they're not interpreting a word-for-word -word translation of what that person said. They're, contact, they're, they're uh, interpreting the context of that message. The word of the Lord says this, and they will interpret that message. And then there are the final three are the dynamic gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are doing and action gifts. The first one is the gift of faith. A supernatural impartation of belief and confidence for a specific situation. Let me tell you how this can come into play in someone's life. Let's say someone is battling cancer. And, and they're, they've got a prognosis that, that's really bad. And they begin to pray and seek God about this situation. Many times what will happen is God will give them a supernatural faith and confidence for the situation that they're in that doesn't make sense with what's going on in the natural. God gives a supernatural faith. And that's the thing you need to understand about all these gifts. These are all supernatural gifts. These are not an improvement upon your gifts as a person. These gifts are beyond you. This is the empowerment of God. This is where we can have a peace that passes understanding in our lives. We get God's kind of faith. It's the faith that something's going to happen even when in the natural it doesn't make sense. A supernatural faith. Guys, we need that all the time. We need that all the time. How are situations gonna change? What is going on in the world? What is going on? Right, right now when we look at what's going on just in our world, we have to have a supernatural faith in God. We need, we need power beyond ourselves because if I just look at things in the natural, how am I gonna overcome these things? How are we gonna deal with these things? I don't have that in me. But when I have the faith that God has inside of me, it changes everything. That confidence and that faith comes in that says no matter what situation I face, my faith is in God. It's his job to determine the outcome of the situation his faith that helps us. Amen. Here's the next gift. It's the gift of healing or healings. It's a supernatural endowment of divine health. Now, let me ask you a question. If you read your book of Acts, you probably remember reading a story where Peter, I think it was Peter and John were walking along. And as they were walking along, their shadow, sun was shining, their shadow fell on people that were sick and they got healed. How crazy is that? They didn't even lay hands on them. It was just their shadow. Was that them? 
Was that their power? No. Sometimes I have a hard time putting my shoes on, much less the ability to supernatural heal somebody. These guys are just walking along and the healing of God, the healing power of God flowed through them to other people. When people said, oh my goodness, look at all the miraculous things you guys are doing. Whenever that would happen to them, they would say, it's not us. It's not us. It's the power of God working in and through us. That is a supernatural gift. Now notice what I said at the beginning. Any of these gifts are available to any person that has the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You say, pastor, I don't have a healing ministry. You don't have to have a healing ministry. You just need to know the healer. And then you, in those moments where someone else needs healing, you can be the vessel that God can flow through to heal somebody else. It's not you. It's him. And listen to me. It's not just physical healing. It's not just physical healing. One of the greatest statements that I believe that Jesus ever made was this. He was talking about his job description. Jesus said, I've come to heal the brokenhearted and set the captives free. You know, it's easy to look around and I remember seeing somebody in first service that had a cast on their arm. Sometimes we can see the wounds that people have on the outside, can't we? Broken arms, stitches, something like that. But you know what I've learned? There's so many people that are walking around functionally, but they're broken on the inside. Their hearts are broken. Their spirit is broken. Sometimes their mind is broken. And when Jesus said, I've come to heal the brokenhearted, he also brings healing to those other areas of our lives too. And so what I'm telling you guys, it's the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. When we receive that baptism now is available to flow through us to other people around us. God wants to heal people in their minds, in their hearts, and in their bodies. And you guys as Christ followers you say, well, I'm not a pastor. How can I pray for somebody? Are you a child of God? The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. That's why we are the church. Do you mean a child can lay hands on someone and they can be healed? Yes, they can. Let me tell you my first experience with seeing God miraculously heal someone or something. I had just been, uh, I was going to college. I would received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I remember I came home from one day from work and I had an English pointer and, and he was a great old dog. His name was JJ. And JJ had two speeds, wide open and sleep. <laughs> Anybody ever been around a dog like that? It's a bird dog, English bird dog. I mean, if he was out of the pen, he was running. Jackrabbits were nervous when this guy would get out. I mean, he could move. And I remember I came, I love that dog. I remember I came home from, from school one day and I walked into the garage and I don't know how he'd gotten loose or gotten out. Somehow he'd gotten in the garage and he had eaten some chemicals. We're out on a farm. He'd gotten into some stuff. He'd also eaten some paper mache. There was chemical bags. I knew he'd eaten that stuff. He was stumbling around. His mouth was frothing. And I knew he was dying. There was no doubt. I know. This is a dead dog. And I remember at 18 years old, thinking, well, God, I know that you're the healer. I've been reading about that. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to pray for my dog. So I got over there by my dog and I kneeled down around him, put my arms on him. And I prayed, Lord, please heal my dog. You know what? God healed my dog. He healed my dog. I learned two things that day. God cares about what you care about. He loved that dog. But I got to watch him heal a dog. But you know what that did for me? Well, if he can heal a dog, he sure, sure as the world heal you. Because he loves people more than he loves dogs. But that was the, isn't that funny how God works? But now I'm like, well, he healed JJ. He healed Rob. He's still doing miracles, guys. And I want to tell you, because I had somebody ask me this morning after the new member class, they said, Pastor, I was wondering how you felt about praying for other animals and things. Listen, if your cows are sick, pray for them, right? You know, I, I'll tell you, 
Brandy, next time all those chickens get sick, lay hands on 20,000 chickens. Just go in there. My hi ha ha. Do it. Just lay your hands on. But, it, but, but here's why I'm telling you. God cares about these things. And sometimes he will give us those little steps of faith to step into something bigger. And that same power of healing can live in you if you've received the baptism. Amen? That's important to remember. Here's the final one. Working of miracles. That covers a whole lot of things, doesn't it? Working of miracles. Divine intervention that alters our natural circumstances. Divine intervention that alters our natural circumstances. That covers everything else. When we deal with the situation in life, when we don't know what to do, when we don't know how things are going, sometimes I firmly, firmly believe that we end up in situations that unless I have said it a thousand times or more in my life, God, if you don't show up, this is going to be a train wreck. Anybody else? God, I need you to do something. But can I tell you over and over in my life, I have seen him miraculously do things that in natural means could never have happened. And that is available to you guys. That's available to you. You say, Pastor, I'm not that good. It's not about how good you are. It's about how good he is. And it is about the promises of God. Do you guys remember a few years ago? Some of you will remember this. It's probably been a while. But I remember when we were outside and we were doing the backpack one year and the storms were going on everywhere. I mean, it was bad. And we thought, this is not going to be good. Danny, you remember this? And we got together as a church and we prayed and said, Lord, hold back the storm. And I remember people that day bringing me pictures of that day. And we were praying and there were storms all around us, but they weren't hitting us. Y'all remember that? There was no natural explanation for that. There was no way that should have happened. And yet God, in those moments, put his hand down and supernaturally said, not yet. And then when we got done, he cleaned off the parking lot. <laughs> there are times in our life when we need God to do what we can't. And he is a supernatural God. Big thought. God still does miracles today because he is a miraculous God. And many, many times he chooses to operate miraculously through his children. These are practical gifts. And I, want to, and I want to make sure you understand that. See, God gives us these gifts and our abilities. And many times he expresses these gifts and abilities, not just in the church, but also out in the world. These gifts are given to us to bless other people. And, and when these things begin to happen, God miraculously shows up. And then people say, how could this have happened except for him? I told this story first service. Some of you may, may or may not have heard it. But, but when I was a young man, I worked at the ballpark in Arlington. I was in the marketing broadcast division for them. They hired me for a job that they created. And, and my job was to raise money and sell stuff. And we were doing commercials and TV shows and all these different things. And my job was to sell that. None of that existed. You know, that, the department didn't exist. And they said, year one, what, what we want you to do is sell a million dollars worth of stuff. They just picked some arbitrary number. Now, understand, I was very much prepared for this job. I was, had been a youth pastor and had been mowing yards. <laughs> Highly qualified. Had an amazing tan. <laughs> okay? So I show up, and I don't know what to do. But they've hired me to do this. So I went to my office. I'll never forget it. First day I went in there, I shut the blinds in my office, got down on the floor and began to pray, God, I can't do this, but you called me to do this. So I'm asking you to supernaturally intervene and bless this business. And he did. That first year from nothing, we raised right at or a little over a million dollars. The next year, we raised about $2 million. And I'll never forget, this is why God does these things. The president of the company called me to his office one day. And I walked into his office, center field at the ballpark, boom, walked in. I remember, because I was down there and he was way at the other end at his big desk. And he said, Chris, now notice these words. He said, we have a question. So they'd been talking. How is this happening? Tell us your strategy. Explain, explain to us how this is happening. 
Now, this is an unbeliever. I didn't say anything. I just said. And he said, I know. I know. See, it was all God. But when the power and the presence of God works through your life, he cares about your business. He cares about your classroom. He cares about your life. And he wants to live and work in and through you. Why? Jesus said, if my name is lifted up, I will draw everyone to me. That means wherever you are, doing whatever it is God's called you to do, when you begin to lift him up and make him big, People are going to see, and he's going to work in and through your life where people can know that maybe there's something to this God stuff. But until they see, they won't know. And the way they're primarily going to see is through your life. So these gifts, yes, we pray for people and they're healed. We do all these things. But the reason they do that, you know what Jesus, this is what Jesus said. How many of you know we should listen to what Jesus said? You know what Jesus said? He said, if you don't believe my words, what I'm saying, believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Look at what I've done. In your life, people may not necessarily believe what you have said, but they can see the evidence of the power of God flowing through your life. And that attracts them to God. That is the truth. So we need the gifts of the Spirit working in and through our life. Now, would you guys all agree, would you all agree that the mission that God has given us is bigger than us? I mean, Jesus said, go into where? All the world. He said, go to all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, that that is a big mission. We are called to reach the entire world. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. I need a volunteer. Who would like to be a volunteer this morning? I need a volunteer. Look at you guys all volunteering. You volunteer? Come here, sir. Come up here. This is one of the guys who was in the new member class. Come on up here. Let's give him a big hand. All right, come on over here. You can step right here to my right-hand side. All right, tell everybody your name. Scotty Barnes. That's a cool name, Scotty. All right, Scotty, here's the deal. Here's the mission. I, got a, I have a mission for you. You ready? This is your mission. You see this board? This is a regular old board, right? Mm-hmm. What is this? Screw. That's a screw. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. You ready? Take that screw, and I want you to drill that screw through that board. Go ahead. <laughs> I look for the weakest spot. You look for the weakest spot at... Is this going to work? No. Why isn't this going to work? Because I don't have the right tools. Say that again. Because I don't have the right tools. Well, what do you need? I need a screwdriver. You need a screwdriver? Or a hammer or something. Okay. What if I one-up you? What if I, what if I empowered you with a tool like this one? <laughs> what about that? What if I empowered you with this tool to do this mission. Could you do this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you just needed the right tool. Right? right? Very good. Give him a hand. That's all you had to do. Good job. Wasn't that easy? Well done. Well done. That is what we're talking about. The mission is too big. In the natural, God says, here's the mission. And we look at this and go, this is impossible. In the natural. In a thousand years, he couldn't have just wound that. It was not going to happen. But what he needed was to be empowered with the right tool. See, spiritually, it's the exact same thing. The Lord said, I'm giving you a mission, but here's the deal. Y'all go wait. Go wait. At Pentecost, 50 days later. And then the power of the Holy Spirit baptized them in the Holy Spirit. And what immediately happened... Peter walked outside and said, I got a screw gun. Here is Jesus. And he began to preach. And thousands of people, the guy before that was scared in the upper room, was now empowered by the Holy Spirit to deliver a message that saved thousands. 
When God calls us, he gives us the ability to be empowered to accomplish the mission that he's called us to do. He's not asking to do something with the Holy Spirit that is impossible, but in the flesh it is. Because we can't fix things. He can fix everything. Now, can I ask you something? Is there any reason you wouldn't want this? <laughs> no. But it's the same with the power of the Holy Spirit. But what the devil wants to do is convince you that this is weird. You don't need this. Keep beating your head up against the wall. It's worked great so far. No. I want to be empowered. I want everything that God has for me. I want more so that I can do everything that he's called me to do. My friends, my neighbors, my family, they don't need Chris. They need more than Chris. They need the Holy Spirit living in and through me because that's the only thing. He's the only person that can change their lives. Do you understand? Never forget this. This is what the baptism is. It's empowered to do the works that he's called us to do to be witnesses for him. So how do we receive this? How do we receive this? Qualifications for being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Three things. You ready? Number one is you have to be saved. You can't be baptized in the Holy Spirit unless you've received Christ. So you have to be saved. Receive Jesus. The second thing you have to be is surrendered. You have to be surrendered to him. And the third thing is you need to be seeking him. Those are the three things. If you're saved, you're qualified. See, here's the deal. Remember the disciples we talked about the other day that the guys were walking down the road and they ran in to those disciples and they said, hey, y'all, have y'all received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? They're like, we have no idea what you're talking about. They said, well, do you want to be? They're like, yeah. That's how hard it was. And they laid hands on them, prayed for them. They said, yeah, we want what Jesus has. Power tool. Yes. Give me that. Am I saved? Yes, I am. This is a big one. Am I surrendered to him? See, I think that's where we get into issues is that we may be saved. There's a lot of saved people that I know. But there's not a lot of surrendered people that I know. I'm saved, but it's condi my, my relationship with Jesus is a little conditional. I want to be saved, but I kind of want to do what I want to do. Right? But when I'm asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, what I'm saying is, remember the title of this series is more. I want more of Jesus and less of me so that I can be more like him. See, where we get into trouble in our relationship with Christ is, the, is not the tug of war with the devil. It's with ourselves. Am I willing to submit? Am I willing to surrender my life to the Lord? Am I willing to say, Jesus, fill me. Push me out. Fill me with you. Make me the person that you want me to be. Give me the gifts, Lord, to accomplish your will. Now, I think another reason, I was talking about some guys about, uh, yesterday about this. I think one of the reasons we don't want to submit the, to this level to the Lord is that we feel like we're going to lose all control and he's going to send us to be missionaries to Africa. Did anybody else ever feel that way? Like, I want some Jesus, but I know people that really love Jesus, and it seems like the people that really love Jesus, they go to Africa. <laughs> In my mind, I'm just telling you, Dave, I mean, did you ever think that? I remember growing up, and these missionaries would come in, and go, wow, man, look at all this stuff. I guess real Christians go to Africa, <laughs> or China, or something. And so what happens is we say, Lord, I want you to have all me, but I don't want you to send me somewhere I don't want to go. That's right. That's right. But you have to step out first. And the first part of that process is submission. If you read your Bible front to back, and this is the, big, this is the biggest thing in my life. Because the Lord told me, Day one, week one, word one, yield, submit. Because my will is so strong. And yet I realized, just like Jesus did on the night that he was betrayed, he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. 
See, if we want to see God operate in our life, if we want to receive the baptism, we have to stay like we talked about the other day, about continually being filled with him. And that means constantly there's more of Jesus, less of me. I tend to get in my own way. You know, Rob and I were laughing about this the other day. I was thinking, man, I know the devil's out there, but he doesn't have to mess with me a whole lot. I can mess with myself. I am good at messing things up. But when I've seen God move the most in my life is when I'm submitted the most. Lord, here I am. Do you realize anyone can do that? If you're saved, you can be submitted. And then the final thing is seeking. Matthew chapter seven, verses seven through 12. This is what Jesus says. Ask, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you? If your son asks for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Wow. So, and I love the way Jesus ended this up. Watch what he does here. So, verse 12, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. <laughs> For this sums up the law and the prophets. He brings it back. So here's what I would say to you, church. Over the last six weeks, we've talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hopefully this has demystified some of this for you. Hopefully you have a better understanding than you've ever had. But here's what I want you to know from my heart to you. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not weird. It's what I need to be the person that God's called me to be. And can I just be bold enough to say it's exactly who you need to in your life? It's not weird. It's power to be a witness. Some of you may be life's beating you up. Some of you may feel powerless. You feel like you're just getting tossed around. You're saved, but there's no power emanating in your life and God's going, I have more for you. I have more for you. Ask, seek, knock. Are you saved? Are you surrendered? Are you seeking? Amen. Let's enter into a word of prayer for a moment. I'd like the prayer team to come forward. I know every week there are different people dealing with different things. I'm, I'm hyper aware of that. I'm hyper aware of that. Sometimes, for me, as a pastor, it's overwhelming to me, all the challenges that people face. Jesus said, my house is to be a house of prayer, and so we want this house to be a house of prayer. And we believe that God can do something about your situation. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I want to I wanna ask God to fill me. Well, we could do that for you here today. Maybe you're facing a sickness in your body, a trial. We believe that God is a healer. He can heal you. Maybe you have a wayward child, wayward spouse. God can draw them home. He is amazing. And he loves you a lot more than he loves my bird dog. He does. Jesus died. He died a horrible death so that you could be free. He rose again so that you would have hope. And he sent the Holy Spirit to be with you and to never leave you and to empower you and to be a comforter to you and to teach you. And he is available to you. And if you're at the place in your life where you wanna draw closer to him and be surrendered, then I want to encourage you that today is a good day for that. So if you're here today, we're just going to take a few moments. We're not going to be in a hurry. We're early. We're not going to be in a hurry. This is important. If you're here today and you have any need at all, whether it's a baptism or sickness or whatever you're dealing with, any prayer request, maybe it's even for a friend. You have a friend that's struggling, you want to pray for them, or a family member. Come up and let us pray for you today.
The altars are open. Let's all stand this morning. We're not going to be in a hurry when I dismiss you in a moment. Just quest it as you exit out. Remember, there are people that are still going to be down here praying. We want to honor that and their time with the Lord. Remember who you are, Christ follower. Remember who He's called you to be. He's called you to be His hands and His feet to your family, to your friends, to the community. You know, it's been said many times, I've read it, I'm sure you have too. Sometimes the only Bible that people will ever read is me and you, our lives. What do they see? Do they see Jesus in you? Do they see Jesus flowing through you? The world needs him, and so the world needs you. Classmates need you guys. They're hurting. Your coworkers are hurting. Our community is hurting. We are God's choice to go. We're plan A. Let's surrender our lives to Him and allow Him to live and work through us. Amen. Father, I thank you for each life represented here today. Lord, I thank you for those online that are watching us. Father, I pray that you would minister to them, even those that watch later, Lord. Because your word never return, returns void, it's timeless. And I pray, Father, that you would reach them. Lord, I pray that as we leave this place, that we would ask ourselves, have I received the baptism? Am I willing to submit my life in such a way where I can have more of Jesus and less of me? Thank you for that. God bless you as you go. Have a great week.